Hi, and welcome to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. We are so pleased to be featuring Nigel Brockton and Karen Collins as we discuss lifestyle medicine and helping patients reduce their risk of cancer. My name is Katie and I'm here today to support the webinar along with our ACLM Director of Membership, Claire. This live webinar is complimentary to everyone as an informational and educational service. It will also be recorded and made available to ACLM members. First, just a quick overview of who we are and what we do. ACLM is the Professional Medical Association for those dedicated to the advancement and clinical practice of lifestyle medicine as the foundation of a transformed and sustainable healthcare system. ACLM addresses the need for quality education and certification, supporting its members in their individual practices and in their collective desire to domestically and globally promote lifestyle medicine as the first treatment option as opposed to a first option of treating symptoms and consequences with expensive, ever-increasing quantities of pills and procedures. ACLM members are united in their desire to identify and eradicate the cause of disease. Lifestyle medicine involves the use of evidence-based lifestyle therapeutic approaches, such as a predominantly whole food plant-based diet, regular physical activity, adequate sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substance use and other non-drug modalities to prevent, treat, and oftentimes reverse the lifestyle-related chronic disease. If you're interested in learning more about becoming a member, you can visit our website at lifestylemedicine.org or email us directly at membership at lifestylemedicine.org. In partnership with the American College of Preventative Medicine, we offer a 32-hour online course called the Lifestyle Medicine Core Competencies Program which is an evidence-based online educational program that covers basic information on the core competencies of lifestyle medicine. There are 10 modules that will cover topics including nutrition, physical activity, health and wellness coaching, sleep health, tobacco cessation, alcohol use, emotional wellness, mindfulness, and more. This online program is available to physicians, allied health professionals, healthcare executives, students, trainees, and anyone interested in signing up to learn more about lifestyle medicine. To learn more and to register, visit lifestylemedicine.org slash LMCC. This lifestyle medicine core competencies course is one of the prerequisites for the lifestyle medicine board certification. There are three different types of certification for physicians, professionals, and bachelor nurses and dietitians. To find out more, please visit ablm.co or contact info at ablm.co. Historically, there has been one lifestyle medicine exam per year, but this year there will actually be two opportunities to sit and become certified in lifestyle medicine. Registration is open for the 2020 ABLM exam on June 14th in Boston, Massachusetts, and on November 5th, directly following the ACLM conference in Carlsbad, California. Please check out our Foundations of Lifestyle Medicine official Lifestyle Medicine Board Review course, which is designed to provide a review and pre prepare candidates to sit for and successfully pass the Lifestyle Medicine Board Certification Exam. This self-study review course consists of a Lifestyle Medicine Board Review Manual, which is available in print form and accessible online in the online course. The manual includes an index, an appendix summarizing key lifestyle medicine research, detailed graphics, tables and figures, more than 130 review questions, and it covers the information from which questions are written for the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine Certification Exam. This course also includes six review lectures led by Drs. Kelly and Scholl. For more information, please visit lifestylemedicine.org slash board review. In partnership with Well Coaches, we also offer an 18-hour online lifestyle medicine for coaches course, which provides an in-depth overview of the leading lifestyle medicine topics. Anyone can take this course for a certificate of attendance. If you are a certified well coach through Well Coaches, or if you've earned the National Board Certified Health and Wellness Coach designation from ICHWC, you may earn the Lifestyle Medicine Coach Certificate upon course completion. Please visit our site for more details. We'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to join us for the 10th Annual Lifestyle Medicine Conference in 2020, which will take place November 1st through 4th at the Omni in Carlsbad, California.
please visit our website at lmconference.org and stay tuned for conference registration, which will be opening very soon. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Nigel Brockton is the Vice President of Research at the American Institute for Cancer Research. Before joining AICR, he gained his PhD in the genetic epidemiology of colorectal cancer from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, and he spent 10 years as a cancer researcher in Alberta, Canada. Focusing primarily on the impact of lifestyle on cancer risk, progression, and survival, particularly in breast, colorectal, and head and neck cancers. He is a two-time cancer survivor and ardent cancer research advocate. He combines all of his passions in his role with AICR to direct the research program and encourage healthy lifestyles through diet, weight management, and physical activity throughout the cancer continuum, prevention, treatment, and survivorship. Karen Collins is a registered dietitian nutritionist who focuses on translating nutrition research to help people cut through the confusion of nutrition headlines and to develop realistic strategies for health. Karen serves as nutrition advisor to the American Institute for Cancer Research. She has authored multiple peer reviewed book chapters and research summaries for health professionals covering cancer prevention and its intersection with cardiometabolic health. Karen has also penned over 2,000 nutrition-related articles for the public. A fellow of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, Karen previously conducted a long-time private practice in nutrition counseling in Western New York. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. I'm going to turn it over to Nigel. Just share my screen here. I'm here, I'm just waiting for this to, there we are. Good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and we're going to talk about lifestyle medicine and cancer, uh, helping your patients reduce their risk. So we'll get straight in. Uh, the outline, we're gonna talk about the American Institute for uh, Cancer Research and World Cancer Research Fund a continuous update project and the third expert report which uh, was published well almost a year and a half ago now uh, over a year and a half ago uh, we'll give you an update uh, of how that evidence was analyzed and reviewed uh, and then so I'm going to cover mainly the evidence side and the recommendations uh, and then Karen will really take over talking about communicating uh, these messages, uh, framing them for patients and clients, uh, addressing some of the common questions, and then how we can translate these into individual advice to individuals. So, there seems to be a bit of a delay when I click. So the key to the continuous update project is really to distinguish evidence from opinion. We've all seen in this sort of world of uh, constant news that one week something is apparently good for us and then the next week it's bad for us because individual studies being published and uh, often the lay press trying to, trying to do a good job by communicating the latest science, um, but it's often out of context with the um, available literature. So back in 1997, uh, the American Institute for Cancer Research uh, and World Cancer Research Fund took it upon ourselves to try and summarize all the global literature on diet, nutrition, and physical activity uh, relating to cancer, predominantly to cancer risk. Uh, at that time, a lot of the information, a lot of the studies were based on case control studies uh, and some of the biases that are inherent in that. So spool forward 10 years to 2007 when there was a lot more information available, a lot more research had been done. Uh, and the second expert report was published. And I realized looking at these images, it looks like the report gets bigger. The evidence behind it gets bigger, but actually the, the, the report that we did in 2018, the version that's printed is only 116 pages. But 
uh, and they were sort of four or five hundred pages for the previous reports and I'll talk about why that is uh, in a moment um, but this sort of comprehensive approach to summarizing the evidence and in 2007 was where the process that was put in place to do, to write the uh, or perform the analyses for the 2007 report uh, is what became known as the continuous update project and this is this robust process that I'm going to take you through in a second and say so in 2018 uh, the next 10 years of work really culminated in the third expert report so this is done by uh, a global um, collaboration over 100 scientists in 17 different countries uh, but the main team that do all the analyses are at Imperial in London and that's the team down there on the right hand side uh, the team on the left the slightly blurry photo uh, is the the last cut panel that evaluated the the evidence and I'm going to talk you through the, the evaluation process but on an ongoing basis the the literature that is published that is relevant and eligible to be included the results are sort of collected from those papers put into a big database there's currently over 10,000 papers on cancer prevention and survival uh, it's the world's largest central resource for scientific evidence on cancer diet uh, weight and physical activity and this is this sort of rolling process that occurs um, to summarize the evidence again for this uh, ultimate goal of distinguishing evidence from opinion there will be either a scheduled or a, a sort of triggered um, response to a, a growth in the literature uh, the team at ICL will do the analyses so all of that information that's been abstracted into the database will be analyzed uh, actually before this there, there are already protocols in place for how the analyses are going to be uh, conducted so it's not some cherry picking uh, ad hoc process afterwards the systematic literature reviews uh, and meta-analysis reports are then generated and externally reviewed and then those reports go to the cut panel which was the blurry photo before uh, and they sit down for a couple of days and go through all these long reports uh, these reports can be up to 2,000 pages long so they're extremely detailed uh, reviews and analyses uh, and the panel get together and go through each exposure and work out how strong the the evidence is so these predefined components of the cup really uh, I mean it's a very transparent process uh, there is little room for any bias within that process we well, there are many occasions when people suggest to us that maybe we should be a little more permissive on some of the data and we have to go with the process that we outline right from the start and we can only say what the data tells us so there's a systematic literature review protocol we generate the uh, the reviews and reports doing these meta-analyses sometimes uh, when we can we do dose response analyses and ideally linear and non-linear linear dose response analyses if we can't if the data is collected in uh, too many different ways then we just do a highest versus lowest uh, generate the continuous update report and then as I say these culminated in the third expert report in 2018 this is how a lot of the data is presented so on the left hand side you see there the linear dose response so this is just an example for alcohol uh, for colorectal cancer um, the next one is the linear sorry the non-linear dose response curve for alcohol showing that uh, the dose kind of it's not significant at the lower levels of alcohol consumption but goes up and later on I'll talk to you about how that, that's not the case in some other cancers where any exposure to alcohol increases your risk so how is all this evidence judged so all these uh, analyses are done but then how is that converted into deciding whether that's strong evidence or not 
So there are predefined again requirements for that. These are really the modified Bradford Hill criteria, which the original version of the Bradford Hill criteria were published back in 1965. Um, but it's really based on the number and types of studies, uh, the quality of the exposure and outcome assessment, the heterogeneity, so how much difference there is between uh, results in studies, whether it increases risk, decreases risk, are, are they all going in the same direction? Exclusion of chance bias and confounding, so these are in the sort of study design components. Is there a biologic gradient, so does more of something have a greater effect or less effect? Uh, is there evidence of mechanisms? Do we have some plausibility of why this uh, exposure might lead to this outcome? And what's the size of the effect? How much of a difference does it make? So all of these things get factored into deciding whether a particular exposure uh, is, whether there's strong evidence that that exposure is related to a, a cancer outcome. Uh, and only those for which the evidence is considered strong and within strong there are two levels of convincing and probable. Um, and again, it's a very transparent process of what constitutes convincing versus probable. Uh, and only those that reach that level of strong can be the basis for a recommendation. But as I'll show, not all of our strong evidence results in a recommendation because we have lots of uh, components of strong evidence, but we only have 10 recommendations. Uh, so I really see this as a, from the sort of recommendations to the, the systematic literature reviews as a funnel of evidence. So this is the, the totality, well, it's not even the totality because there would be another layer above of the protocols that underline uh, all of this work, uh, but then you probably wouldn't be able to see anything on here. Um, the printed summary is that bottom left-hand corner, um, which is really the sort of the highlights and key information from the whole uh, third expert report. But then online at cancerreport.org, uh, sorry, dietandcancerreport.org, uh, you can find all of these available as free PDFs. So you have the, the CUP reports, um, which is sort of one layer down at the top. These are all the cancer specific uh, continuous update project reports. Then the exposure chapters below that are really going through each exposure and how they relate to each cancer. So it's kind of the, the, the mirror image, if you like, of the um, cancer, cancer report, the cancer specific reports. And then there are these supporting chapters like uh, the cancer process and judging the evidence and the recommendations and determinants of diet, uh, sorry, de determinants of weight gain, overweight and obesity. Uh, so although the printed summary is only 116 pages, the bulk of what we sort of consider the third expert report is 2000 pages. And if you included the SLRs, it's 12,000. But when we published the, um, the first and second expert report, if we tried to take the same approach with this one, it would have been 2000 pages and nobody would want to carry it around. Uh, so this is kind of the funnel of evidence from the systematic literature reviews uh, to the recommendations. If there is a, an exposure you're particular, particularly interested in uh, with, in relation to a particular cancer uh, and you don't see it in either the uh, printed report or the cup report, then all of the evidence related to it will be in the uh, systematic literature review. And this whole process covers 17 cancers, 51 million people and three and a half million cancer cases. So it's an enormous amount of work. <laughs> uh, so what's in it for you? Uh, it is a, an authoritative uh, synopsis of the available evidence. So when you have, if there's something that you see some information about, this is a really good place to try and verify that. Uh, it provides some fairly high level um, details of biologic mechanisms, but at least to the extent that we know them at this point in time. Uh, it highlights some of the gaps in research and understanding fairly transparently. 
uh, it's reliable advice for patients. So whether it's from the sending, referring people to the individual reports or to pages on the website, it's all based on the evidence from our report. And fundamentally less leg, leg work for you. It's a sort of one-stop shop for anything you want to know about the role of diet, nutrition, physical activity, and cancer. So that's where to find it. Uh, you can actually just go directly to uh, dietandcancerreport.org uh, uh, or you can go through the AICR website. So what do we know right now? So if you, if you have a copy of the third expert report uh, of that 116 page uh, summary on the back cover of it, if you fold it out, there's this sort of trifold page which gives you all these exposures along the top on all the cancers down the left and this shows both the strong and the limited suggestive uh, data evidence um, on page 46 of the report there is the strong evidence matrix which I put this up here to highlight the fact that for some cancers like colorectal we know an awful lot. There are 10 factors that we know increase and decrease risk. And then for things like prostate, which there's been a lot of research done on, but still the only strong evidence that we have is for diet, uh, sorry, for adult uh, body fatness and adult attained uh, height. So still lots to learn there. Moving into our recommendations, the, the principle they're based on is that this is a package for people to follow. And yes, we, we want people to follow all of them, but Karen, who will be speaking shortly, uh, said it best at the launch of our report, which said it's a call for action, not perfection. So anything you can do to uh, meet these recommendations will reduce your risk of cancer. Uh, they are relevant across the world. There's nowhere in the world that these uh, would not make sense uh, in terms of adopting behaviors that change your risk, reduce your risk. Uh, and they also do take into account some of the uh, reduction in risk in other chronic diseases. Here they are. I'm, I'm not going to go through this in detail other than just to mention that we do also mention in the middle there, not smoking and avoiding other exposures to tobacco and excess sun are also important factors. But the focus of AICR, WCRF is diet, uh, physical activity and weight management. Which brings us on to the first recommendation is to be a healthy weight, keep your weight within the healthy range and avoid weight gain in adult life. And then there's some additional sort of goals in there, um, but I'm just gonna skip through to give you the this is based on at least 12 types of cancer for which uh, obesity increases risk. Uh, endometrial is the strongest one. As you can see, the size of these diamonds reflects the amount of evidence that's there. So an awful lot in colorectal and breast cancer. Um, so controlling your weight is the strongest uh, recommendation to reduce cancer risk. The, there is strong evidence that early adult obesity decreases premenopausal breast cancer. Um, and although this is uh, a real biologic effect, we don't understand the mechanism. And it's certainly not a public health message that we would be trying to communicate to get people to be overweight or obese or have obesity in early adult life to de decrease their uh, premenopausal breast cancer risk. But it is a, um, a real phenomenon. So we do want to highlight it and we want uh, to try and advocate for research in that area to find out what's going on. Hand over to you quickly, Karen. Yes, so the goals are to set a trajectory toward the lower end of the healthy adult range of BMI and to stay there throughout life, avoiding weight gain, whether measured by BMI or waist size. This is related to ad excess adipose tissue, raising levels of estrogen, um, insulin and insulin-like growth factors, and uh, chronic low-grade inflammation. That's one of the hallmark characteristics enabling cancer development. 
the, at the population level, studies show lowest cancer risk at the lower end of healthy BMI. However, the same BMI and waste can represent different levels of body fat in people who differ in ethnic background, age, and other factors. As health professionals, we talk with individuals about a weight and waste that are healthy for them. It's helpful to also consider waist size and weight gain, since even with a normal BMI, a significant portion of adults have metabolic abnormalities reflecting excess body fat. We need to help people talk about weight removed from a culture of body shaming, and we need to clarify that people can take positive actions without restrictive diets that promote a cycle of weight loss and regain. For people with overweight or obesity, even modest amounts of intentional weight loss can produce clinically significant changes in biomarkers of cancer risk, such as insulin resistance, estrogen, and markers of inflammation. It's likely that for people with excess body fat, modest intentional weight loss could reduce their cancer risk, but right now the amount and quality of long-term data is limited. Long-term maintenance of weight can be challenging, so avoiding weight gain can be an important goal for people currently at a healthy weight and those who have overweight. Yep. Sorry, uh, let me go back. Um, two of the AICR recommendations, Nigel, can you take the slide back? There we are. Thank you. Um, two of the AICR recommendations directly support a healthy weight, and in addition, several of the recommendations that offer direct benefits for reducing cancer risk, those aimed at alcohol, physical activity, and a high-fiber plant-focused eating pattern bring, um, as a side benefit, help in shifting the balance of calorie consumption versus calorie expenditure that can make it easier to reach and maintain a healthy weight. And if we implement these recommendations while bringing in the skills that other research shows helpful to avoid weight gain or regain, we do have a platform that can help achieve and maintain an individually determined healthy weight while supporting overall health. So our next recommendation is to be physically active. Uh, and be physically active as part of everyday life, walk more and sit less. And in the US, this means our recommendation is to follow the, the national guidelines of 150 minutes of moderate activity a week uh, and limit sedentary habits. And this is based on partly due to its role in uh, weight management, but directly in reducing the risk of colon cancer, endometrial cancer, uh, and both pre and post menopausal breast cancer. So uh, in addition to uh, weight management, just being active independently uh, decreases your risk of these cancers. That's you Karen. Mm. So Nigel mentioned the, the goals here, um, which are, as he said, in conjunction with our national goals. Um, as we message about this, we need to reshape our messages about physical activity and separate it from discussions of weight. That's a, a real um, issue for many people. We need to help people understand that, yes, physical activity can indirectly reduce cancer risk through its role in reaching and maintaining a healthy weight. But what often gets completely overlooked is that physical activity can have have direct physiological effects likely to be cancer protective, including improved levels of insulin and sex steroid hormones and better immune function. For people um, who need help, I encourage them to set attainable goals and find ways to incorporate physical activity in what they're already doing and blocks of sedentary time they could replace with some form of activity. Um, try to help them find the immediate benefit, how it feels, how their sleep improves, the relaxation they get, so that they don't need to reward activity with food. So uh, when we launched the report, uh, there was a question that we have one recommendation for uh, body weight, or, uh, we have one recommendation for physical activity, and really five recommendations that are based on diet. And the question was, you know, does that mean diet is five times as important? Um, it's not necessarily, but it's definitely at least five times as complex to try and communicate. So we've broken the recommendations out into components that uh, can steer people towards uh, a healthful diet. So the first one of those is to eat a diet that's rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans. Uh, seeds and nuts are definitely in that category as well, 
or that the individual studies uh, supporting those um, are not reported to the same degree. Uh, make these part of your everyday usual life. This is largely based on uh, colorectal cancer, but also aggregated uh, upper air digestive cancers as well. Uh, we see for whole grain intake, there's a 17%, this is a linear dose response analysis, 17% reduced risk per 90 grams per day. Uh, for fiber, uh, per 10 grams per day, uh, there's a 9% decreased risk. Uh, this is for colorectal cancer. Uh, so strong effects, particularly as you, this is per 10 grams and the recommendation is for fiber, uh, I think a 30 grams, are they, Karen? Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't know these things. Um, so you can, you know, if you're getting sufficient fiber and this is a linear dose response, then you know, you know, 27% less likely to get colorectal cancer. So the goals of this recommendation are to include whole grains, non-starchy vegetables, fruits and legumes in most meals, and as Nigel said, in doing to so accumulate a total of at least 30 grams of fiber from food sources each day. Now keep in mind that as we reach that total amount of fiber, we're getting much more than fiber alone. You reduce cancer risk with five or more standard servings of non-starchy vegetables and fruits each day. And when we say one serving, we're referring to a half cup of most raw cooked vegetables or fruits or one cup of raw leafy vegetables. Vegetables and fruits beyond two and a half cups a day are recommended in guidelines focused on cardiovascular disease and consumption beyond this level is linked with further decrease in cancer risk. But it's critical that we meet people where they are. And the biggest difference in cancer risk is between those with very low intake of vegetables and fruits and those who regularly include five a day. So a simple starting point in talking with people is to include some vegetable or fruit in every meal, then move on to adding more for additional benefits. And rather than emphasizing fresh, help people identify and use fresh, frozen, and canned options without excess added sugar, sodium, and calories that work for them. The recommendations talk about non-starchy vegetables. This does not mean that people must avoid choices like potatoes to eat healthfully. But two thirds of US potato consumption is as French fries, chips, and other processed products. So rather than disparaging potatoes, encourage people to be conscious of portions and preparation and increase their vegetable consumption by expanding variety. To reach the goal of at least 30 grams of fiber from food sources each day, on average, the American adult needs to boost fiber consumption about 13 grams a day. That's achievable, generally with a swap or two in plant food choices at each meal. AICR recommendations call for including whole grains in most meals as part of a healthy eating pattern. For most people, this should be accomplished as a swap for refined grains or highly processed foods, not simply in addition to current eating habits. Pulses like dried beans and lentils are a powerful tool to meet recommendations for dietary fiber. Evidence does not support a specific amount for lower cancer risk, but the target of a half cup three times a week for overall health in the Dietary Guidelines for Americans is an achievable place to start, and working toward even more frequent intake makes it far easier to reach recommended levels of fiber. The bottom line, this recommendation is calling for a plant-based diet. However, this wording can be tricky. Some people use the term plant-based diet to refer to a plants only diet. We need to be clear that many different approaches can make plant foods the foundation of daily food consumption. I often use terms like a plant focused diet to be clearly giving a more inclusive interpretation. Current American eating habits don't provide the variety or amount of nutrient rich plant foods that research suggests is most beneficial. A variety of plant foods provides the widest array of fiber types, nutrients, and phytocompounds. And from a behavioral standpoint, greater variety may enhance consumption. Thank you, Karen. And just to reiterate that point on the uh, um, fiber being in 10 gram increments reflects how low the, the fiber intake is in, in many of these research studies. So. Uh, so the next one is our fast food recommendation uh, to limit consumption of fast foods and other processed foods high in fat, starches or sugars. Uh, limiting these foods will help control calorie intake and maintain a healthy weight. So 
the the cancer literature is has not done this very much at all directly so a lot of this the research this is based on is really through the link uh through increased risk of cancer through obesity and the link of these foods and these dietary patterns uh with obesity so uh, in for the third expert report we did an umbrella review so a review of reviews because it's an enormous literature uh, to look at energy balance and body fatness. Um, so using uh, weight gain, overweight and obesity as the outcome. But you can see a lot of the same uh, sort of usual suspects there of the things that reduce your risk, uh, even though whole grains and fruits and vegetables were in the limited suggestive category, the physical activity, uh, foods containing fiber, Mediterranean type diets are in the reducing the risk of weight gain, overweight and obesity, uh, fast foods, Western type diet uh, up there in the um, strong evidence for increasing risk. Just a, one quick aside, the, the difference between the screen time for uh, adults and children, the reason it's in the convincing category for children and the probable for adults is actually because the most adult studies have been observational uh, prospective cohorts and a lot of the pediatric uh, studies have been randomized control trials so that's more about the study design influencing the strength of the evidence rather than any difference in the underlying effect. So a few nuances regarding this recommendations and your communications about it. Most foods undergo some form of processing before consumption. We're talking about limiting foods that are highly processed, highly processed in ways that increase calories and reduce nutrients. And let's clarify our talking points about quote unquote starchy foods. Technically, the whole grains that we just discussed linked with lower cancer risk are high in starch. We're talking about limiting refined starches. And since the aim of this recommendation is to support a healthy weight, it makes sense to especially target those we might call indulgent grains that are prepared in combination with high loads of fat or sugar that make them concentrated in calories. And focus on reducing foods high in added sugars. We need to be clear with people that fruits do not promote weight gain and may even help avoid it. So our next recommendation is for um, to limit the consumption of red and processed meat. Uh, eat no more than moderate amounts of red meat, such as beef, pork, and lamb, and eat little, if any, processed meat. So this is based on the evidence uh, this uh, forest plot that I'm showing you now is for red and processed meat together. Uh, 100 grams per day uh, gives a 12% increased risk of colorectal cancer. But then when we start splitting this out into red and processed meat separately, for 100 grams you still you have this 12% increased risk of colorectal cancer with, and th this is very consistent. And if anyone heard the, or was aware of the Nutrirex papers that came out uh, at the end of September, um, which basically found the same risk, risk estimates that we have with red and processed meat, but then told everyone to ignore them because they weren't based on randomized control trials. Uh, and so it was based on, in the grade terms, low certainty uh, evidence. But there's never going to be randomized control trials of giving people a lifetime of red meat to compare them to people who are randomized to not getting red meat. So we have to go with the strongest evidence we have. And this has been consistent through three decades of AICR, WCRF analyses. Uh, and so, <laughs> We are very confident <laughs> and stand by these results. So um, for red meat, there's an increased risk, uh, becomes significant at higher intakes, but for processed meat, uh, there's a 16% increased risk, even at 50 grams per day. And I'll show you some, uh, oh, no, I don't have that data. Okay. I have another uh, slide, that, sorry Karen, just <laughs> in, that for processed meat, the risk increases at any intake of processed meat. 
So yes, yeah, so people who eat red meat should keep amounts to no more than 12 to 18 ounces a week. And processed meat, as Nigel pointed out, poses so much greater risk that we really um, advise much more caution keeping amounts to no more than occasional use. We generally talk about meeting the goal of no more than 12 to 18 ounces of red meat per week as keeping it to no more than three times a week. However, if you're talking to people who stick to a really small deck of card size portion, which is about three ounces, that could be four to six portions a week. Red meat technically includes all mammalian meat, but for most people, we're talking about beef, lamb, and pork. People sometimes ask about potential exceptions. What about lean red meat or grass-fed meat? Choosing lean meat is recommended for heart health, but that's not a green light for unlimited portions. The mechanisms that research supports as most likely linking red meat and cancer risk are not based on fat content. Red meat is higher than poultry or seafood in heme iron, which can lead to production of free radicals that damage DNA and can promote formation of n nitroso compounds within the gut. Emerging evidence also links diets high in red meat with changes in the gut microbiota that seem to be associated with chronic infl some inflammation. So for now, our best message is to consider all red meat within the recommended limit of 12 to 18 ounces per week. Processed meat refers to meat that is smoked, cured, salted, fermented, or has added preservatives. Common examples include bacon, ham, sausage, hot dogs, and salami. People often ask about alternative versions here too. What about turkey hot dogs or bacon that's cured by nitrates from celery instead of traditional nitrite and thus labeled uncured? Human data is negligible about these products, but they are generally smoked and or ultimately nitrate cured, so they're still best left to minimal use. Since current intake in the US averages almost an ounce a day of processed meat, there are many people who need some help identifying alternative choices. And we need to emphasize that a change in meat consumption is a chance to reorient their plates in a shift that makes it easier to meet overall cancer protective recommendations. So our next recommendation is to limit consumption of sugar sweetened drinks, uh, drink mostly water and unsweetened drinks. And again, this is based on uh, the more the link with obesity uh, and a driver of, of that risk factor rather than specific evidence linking sugar sweetened beverages to cancer risk. So as you see from our um, energy balance and body fatness report, it's right up there in the convincing uh, category. So yes, the goal is to drink water and other unsweetened drinks, such as unsweetened tea or coffee, as primary beverage choice. And this involves limiting not only regular soda, but a wide range of drinks that people may see as a little sweet without realizing how high in added sugars they are, especially in the large portions that have become commonplace. People may need help making this transition to water as their primary beverage and finding alternatives that are realistic and acceptable for them. Evidence does not link beverages sweetened with non-nutritive sweeteners with an increase in cancer risk. So the question is whether they are or are not helpful for each individual in reaching and maintaining a healthy weight and managing overall health. It's best not to recommend even 100% fruit juice to replace sugar sweetened beverages since large amounts could lead to weight gain. But we don't need to advise most people to completely switch away from juice, simply encourage portion awareness and increasing solid fruit to meet the goals of greater fruit consumption. The next recommendation is to limit alcohol consumption. So for cancer prevention, it's best not to drink. And this is linked to uh, its role in increasing the risk of seven types of cancer, um, so six types of cancer. Um, I seem to be missing a slide, maybe it's in it, yeah, no, missing a slide. <laughs> um, so it, I showed the graph on the right for colorectal cancer earlier. Um, so that's one where, you know, somewhere in the sort of two to three, two, two drinks a, a day, uh, the risk becomes significant, but for esophageal cancer, any amount of alcohol consumption significantly increases risk for breast cancer, any amount uh, increases risk. So for, for cancer prevention, we, we recommend that people do not drink. Uh, the bad news is that it doesn't matter, you know, although there are health halos out there on red wine, 
Uh, it doesn't matter what you drink, it increases your risk of cancer. So you may choose to drink, but from a cancer prevention point of view, it's definitely best not to. Right. And for those who choose to drink, it's important to limit intake to no more than two drinks a day for men and one drink a day for women. A key message point when you're talking to people, one drink is defined as providing 14 grams of ethanol. Normally, that's 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, or one and a half ounces of distilled spirits. But with the growing popularity of higher alcohol content beverages, like many craft beers and fortified wines, along with larger and larger glass sizes, it's getting easy for one drink to pose more risk than it seems. Nigel uh, referred to the health halo for many people, and it is really important to clarify for, for people who have this feeling that there's some kind of safe version that this uh, link with cancer risks does um, is consistent regardless of, of form. Many people link wine with a Mediterranean diet, but when components of the diet are considered separately, wine generally has the smallest and not statistically significant association with health. So wine may culturally be a part of the Mediterranean diet, but from a health perspective, it's an optional feature, not a core element. Uh, we recommend not taking supplements for cancer prevention. There are reasons for people to take supplements, um, but cancer prevention is not one of them. Uh, and we recommend that people aim to meet their nutritional needs through diets alone. Yes, it's important to um, emphasize that although people may think a supplement seems like insurance, um, but that's when they're thinking that un only unrealistically high levels of foods like fruits and vegetables can protect health. We need to emphasize that achievable amounts of nutrient-rich foods do make a difference. And we need to educate people that the concept, if some is good, more is better, does not apply to reducing cancer risk. So a key message is that getting nutrients and phytocompounds from food brings a whole range of protectors that can act in multiple ways against cancer development. Sorry, next, yeah, but... next recommendation is to, uh, for mothers to breastfeed their baby if you can. Uh, breastfeeding is good for the health of the mother and for the baby. Yes, breastfeeding uh, lowers a mother's risk of both pre and postmenopausal breast cancer and babies not only benefit in so many other ways, but by uh, reducing the risk of obesity may also um, benefit with long term lower cancer risk. The goal is exclusive breastfeeding uh, for the first six months and then along with solid foods up to two years or as desired by mother and baby. As they choose to and are able, the longer women breastfeed their babies, the greater their protection against cancer. And our final recommendation is that after a cancer diagnosis, follow our recommendations if you can. We always recommend that you check with your health professional to see what is right for you. And this is really a recommendation uh, to follow them as far as possible after the acute stage of treatment. So once that uh, treatment phase is being completed, there may be some benefits during treatment, but our recommendations are based on that after treatment phase. And this is really based on the fact that we now have uh, approximately 32 million people worldwide uh, living with it after a cancer diagnosis. Um, there's persuasive evidence that diet, nutrition, and physical activity predict important outcomes, but limited evidence that changing these uh, after a diagnosis actually uh, alters the clinical course. Um, but this, the, the panel, the CUP panel on reviewing all this evidence, it, it's unlikely to be harmful to survivors who have finished treatment. Uh, and this, this is the area that actually AICR, WCRF are predominantly focusing on over the next two or three years. Um, we have a breast cancer, so another a repeat of the breast cancer report that was done in 2014 uh, coming out uh, probably next year. Um, because in 2014, again, as I said at the beginning, we, we, will only, uh, we can only say what the uh, evidence is telling us. And as the evidence was in 2014, there was nothing that reached the, the bar of strong evidence for increasing or decreasing risk. There are some suggestive factors there. Um, but if we're going to give cancer, um, try and give specific advice to uh, cancer patients, uh, 
uh, cancer survivors, then uh, we need that strong evidence. And we're hoping that from the analyses that have just been done that will lead to the next uh, breast cancer survivor report, uh, that we'll be in a position to do that. Yeah, and so I'm just going to move us ahead to talk about translation since that's um, part of the, the important name of the game here. Um, when you talk with patients, remember that people come in with various um, perceptions already and surveys like those done periodically by AICR show that although awareness is growing, um, nearly half the people you talk to uh, will um, not know that excess body fat and processed meats increase cancer risk and uh, e even less than half are aware of some of these other factors we've discussed today. So this is important information to be sharing with people. Um, it's helpful to begin conversations with patients about setting priorities for lowering their cancer risk by discussing where they're starting. And AICR's Cancer Health Check is an interactive online tool that in only a few minutes people can get personalized feedback based on how their habits compare to current recommendations. The New American Plate is AICR's practical approach to putting these recommendations in place. And the New American Plate Challenge is a free online program for the public to support learning how to put the recommendations into practice one step at a time. Whether independently or as part of the challenge, tracking progress and using the results for learning and revising strategies is a core part of creating new lifestyles. You can turn to the uh, research section of the AICR website, as Nigel mentioned, um, for all the backup information that you may want in answering people's questions. Um, and then the, on the site that uh, you were given, you can find this interactive matrix. To help you stay up to date when your co patients or colleagues are frustrated, AICR has a food facts library that can, for example, provide the information that soy foods um, uh, are perfectly safe for breast cancer survivors. And the food facts library has lots of other information about different foods um, that you may hear about in the news. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing the slides. Um, also, just to thought that people may be looking for new ways to prepare healthy foods and the AICR website is a place for that. And remember that we need to help people address the barriers they see. Um, we can do that. There are tools for doing that. And um, we need to just help people set a few specific individualized priorities for lowering their cancer risk by starting where they are compared to the key choices highlighted by the AICR recommendations rather than having vague goals of eating healthy. Next slide, please, Nigel. Um, to summarize, talking about cancer risk often involves fear, um, but this message is about positive steps that people can take in being active and choosing what they eat and drink that are effective ways to reduce cancer risk. Next slide. These then are the recommendations that address the major modifiable risk factors for cancer after smoking. As you talk about reducing cancer risk, one of the most important points may be to emphasize the value of basing choices on recommendations and reports from trusted authorities like AICR, not on single studies and hearsay. Greatest effectiveness comes from applying these recommendations as an overall package, encourage people to follow as many recommendations as possible, while emphasizing that each step closer will help lower cancer risk. Next slide, yeah. Dr. Brockton and I would like to thank the American College of Lifestyle Medicine for the opportunity to walk through these evidence-based recommendations and these message points and tools that we hope will help you feel equipped to address common misunderstandings and questions. And we thank you for participating. Stop share here. Great. Um, thank you so much, Nigel and Karen, for this enlightening webinar on lifestyle medicine and uh, cancer risk. Um, we are unfortunately close to the hour, so we will not have time for um, Q&A, but Nigel and Karen have graciously shared their contact information on the previous slide, um, and we invite you to um, reach out directly via um, our website, ACLM, uh, lifestylemedicine.org, um, AICR.org. Um, you can email membership at lifestylemedicine.org. 
education at lifestylemedicine.org. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, again, thank you, Nigel and Karen, for being here today and speaking to us about lifestyle medicine and cancer. Everyone, please remember the webinar has been recorded and made available to ACLM members in the members only section of the ACLM website. If you're interested in learning more about lifestyle medicine, subscribing to our newsletter, or becoming an ACLM member, please visit lifestylemedicine.org and feel free to contact us at membership at lifestylemedicine.org. Join us for our next webinar on March 31st at 1 p.m. Central, where we will discuss lifestyle medicine and pregnancy. If you know anyone that would be interested in this webinar, please pass along the information. You can sign up at lifestylemedicine.org webinar. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful day.